Hi, I'm Matthew Blades, and Learn From People Who Lived It has a great partner, ASI, or Advanced Systems Integration. They design and install cutting-edge audio and visual equipment. This woman-owned small business is big enough to find a solution for your next corporate build-out or school project, and can even slide in to service your existing system. Bring in ASI and two decades of AV experience. I hope you'll visit their website at asi-av.com to see their gallery of work. Well, hi, it's Matthew Blades, and welcome to a bonus episode of Learn From People Who Lived It. If you've got teenagers, please spend the next 45 minutes with us. Mariam Tahiri lived in four continents prior to settling down in the United States. She's got a master's degree in business administration and management. She's a polyglot and considers herself a cultural individual. She speaks, reads, and writes in five languages and comes from a family of health professionals. Listen to this. Her dad is a doctor. Her mom's a retired nurse. Her sister an OBGYN. Dad's finishing building a hospital in Africa in Casablanca, Morocco. Currently, Miriam works with young teens between the ages of 12 and 25 and has a hope to heal one child at a time to help them reach their true and best potential. Do you love it? She's fantastic, and she joins us for a very important conversation tonight about teenagers and the state of their mental health. What kinds of stuff are you dealing with on the daily inside those walls? So, you know, parents call really, you know, being frustrated. Some of them, they call in because they don't know what they, what kind of help they're seeking. Even sometimes some parents may not even know what their child needs. You know, they go to so many doctors, they go to ER, they spend nights in hospitals with the hope that their child can come home safe. And you have different issues. You have parents coming in with a lot of kids these days that I'm noticing having um, suicidal ideation. Um, some of them have a lot of, um, a lot of issues with depression. Some of them have anxiety issues. Um, some of them have traumatic events. So they have a lot of conf- family conflict. And sometimes the parents are just giving up. They tell, come to me and be like, I give up. I can, I don't know what to do with my child. Please help. Yeah. And they're very desperate. And when they are desperate, they're leaning on you. They said, this is the only person who can help me. And you have to be strong. You have to be willing to listen. And you have to show empathy. You have to be willing to be there and be, yes, I can listen to you without any judgment. And that's what I uh, my attitude is every day, to listen to those parents, making sure that I'm there for them. And be like their therapist. Just listen to them and then provide them with a the solution at the end. Yeah, right. Well, everything you said is backed up by the numbers, right? We were talking about it a minute mm-hmm. ago. Uh, you know, ER visits are up 20% for boys, 50% for girls, and anxiety yeah. and depression is the reason cited. Uh, suicidal attempts, as you just yeah. mentioned, are actually up a little bit, especially yeah. with girls right now, as you well that's know. Mm-hmm. Um you know, and that's that just puts us in a spooky place. And here's also, I think, what's important. One in three adults is living with anxiety or depression as well. Yeah. And in some respects, you know, it's that old homage. You have the blind leading the blind, right? You have the, you have the hurt people helping the hurt people. And so it, it can be a really tough cycle to get out of. And that's why people don't. You, mm-hmm. you hear about this all the time. At least this is my opinion. You hear about generational cycles all the time. This is why they're so difficult to break because they take a lot of work to come out of it. Um, and, and, but this is an area where boy coming out of it could be pretty, pretty helpful to you and, and your kids. Right. And, right. and future generations. So mm-hmm. y- you mentioned the T word trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, that's going to look a lot different for a 12 year old than it is a 25 year old. Right. Correct. Um, I think most people know my story at the age of 23, my dad had a heart attack in front of mm. me and, and passed away. I tried to mm. save his life, but I couldn't. Right. And, at 23 years old, a young adult processing that trauma is pretty different from what, you know, say my 13 year old son's going to go through. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. What capacities are they going to be different? Because that's a really great lesson for parents to understand that they're, you know, not little 18 year olds. They're in fact, 13, 10, 12. You know, one, one thing that I notice when I do my clinical interviews with children is when I ask them about trauma, their response is always different than what the parent is looking at what trauma looks like. So when a 13 year old tells me his trauma, I can definitely have a picture that definitely something was really in that kid. And how come the mom or the dad were not being able to detect their early symptoms? Because trauma can be in school, it can be with a classmate, it can be anywhere. And sometimes kids 
internalize those trauma. Um, and I think if the parents are not having a great or healthy communication with their children, the children can hold in that feeling for such a long period of time. And that can be until 23 years old, or that can be even for a long period of time. So I think it's very important as a parent to be able to detect early signs, um, to understand what their kids are going through. And sometimes kids are talking to us not only verbally, but I think they're talking to us non-verbally. Sometimes just the way how they're um, talking to us in a dinner table. They might be able to say that I'm being hurt mom today or I'm not feeling well, but if they're not eating like they used to eat or they're not being active in their social environments like they used to, or their favorite TV show is on and they don't want watch it anymore, we notice that the behavior changes. And as we notice that behaviors are changing, that's what we are able to detect that there's a little bit more going on with our children. So let's first, we're going to get to that support piece in just a second, because mm-hmm. it's so important. Yes. But let's mm-hmm. first maybe talk to some kids who are smart enough to be here and smart right. enough to be checking this out because they, you know, they, they feel like, man, I don't know, something's not right. I don't know mm-hmm. what it is, but something's <laughs> not right. You know, uh, how, what can you do to help young people in in that situation because you can never say this to a child and get them to understand but we've all been there we have all been your age we have all felt your hurt your pains we've all felt the things that you think you're the only one on earth feeling right right um we just have a different lens about it now so what, what are you saying to younger folks So I always let younger folks know that we've been there the same as they've been there. I think if they can find that they can relate, they can feel more, they can trust you more. So if I tell a child that I've had a traumatic event, but it may not be the same um, trauma that that kid has lived, but I also had trauma, but I overcame my trauma. It's okay to feel sadness. It's okay to be happy. So I think a child needs to feel comfortable that, okay, being sad is part of life. Being happy is part of life. Being disappointed is part of life. So once we are okay with emotions, negative or positive, I think we can slowly heal this child. We can slowly give them the copes and, and the skills on how they can get better. And that's what I've noticed. I had the mom um, tell me that she has a daughter who basically currently is living with Lyme disease and it's been affecting her child to continue to finish her high school. But she's Mm -hmm. a very smart young lady. Um, She has A's on her classes, but she always stays in her room. She does not want to leave her room. She does not want to go to class although she has A's in her um, in school. So when I talked to her, I said, you're really smart. You really know what's wrong. You really know exactly what's bothering you. And she said, yes, I do, but I'm scared to to go on. And I'm like, don't be scared. You're almost going to finish your high school. You have three more months. And then her birthday was in May. So I connected her birthday with her graduation. I said, you have two things to celebrate. You have your birthday coming up. You have your graduation to, to come up as well. So I think once she saw that somebody is able to listen and connect with with her birthday, which is a happy day for her, a graduation, which is also a happy moment for her to celebrate, she felt much better. And she told that to her mom. She said, my daughter was very comfortable with you. You really made her feel important. Well, and there's something that happened there that's just to me is the coolest <laughs> thing in the world, right? Is that that you've you made a connection with her, right? You Correct. made you, exactly. you made you heard her. She felt seen. And yes. oftentimes on the outside looking in, especially dads, we want to fix, 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 yes. fix the whole thing, right? When that's not really what this situation <laughs> calls for, is it? Mm-hmm. It okay. it it is a little bit more of a hands-off approach. And but Oftentimes we want to look for something so radically awesome to save our child when it might be right in front of us. And as simple as a birthday and a graduation, as simple as a little event to look forward to coming up, right? It doesn't need to be this big grand thing and situation every time. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, and I say that because that puts a lot of parents on pressure to come up with the thing. And then Mm -hmm. when you present it to your kid and they're already not in a great headspace and they don't want to do it. And, you you know, then you just down a whole rabbit hole that that, that's tough. Mm -hmm. Um, So you mentioned coping, you mentioned Mm -hmm. skills. Maybe Mm -hmm. we pass out a couple of things. You know, for me, breathing has been one of Mm. the easiest and greatest things that I have really bought into now. I say that as somebody who's been meditating for 12 years and mm-hmm. and only really paid attention to my breath mm-hmm. when I was meditating. But now mm-hmm. I'm paying attention to my breath 
all throughout the day okay. and noticing when I'm a little bit tense and when I need mm. to settle down. Right. Yeah. And so for me, breath has been my easiest and freest and cheapest way to yeah. really calm things down. Yeah. Um, what are some other coping mechanisms and skills and tools that you can pass out? I think for me, you know, being in Arizona, we have to take advantage to our mountains and mm. take advantage to um, beautiful weather, especially right now. You know, like hiking has been one of my therapies myself, even when I want to feel better for me. Uh, we all have our moments, like when I go to the mountains and when I hike and I feel like I'm really exercising, I get some fresh air. I get the beautiful um, mountains and their fresh air. I think, you know, to take our kids outside, don't leave them just with electronic and stay home for a long period of time. It's very healthy to take them outside. And it can be just at the park. It can be at the mountains or it can be anywhere. We can do a picnic with the family. We don't have to eat at home. We can just go eat outside and we have a small picnic. I think, you know, to be creative with our kids and have them get involved with us, have them participate in our activities. If we're going to do something, let's have a family discussion. Hey, where should we go next weekend? What about if we go to Flagstaff and go to the snow or let's go somewhere else? I think when we involve the kids in our everyday routine, I think they feel that they are part of the group. And once yeah, we involve a, them, I think they feel safe. They feel that they're going to not want to stay home. Yes, let's go out. Yeah, absolutely. And it's that great. Yeah. I, there's a parenting philosophy called love and logic. And, and they're yeah. just so big on this whole thing about, you know, mm -hmm. and, and serve up choices. It's like, we're going to go to Flagstaff this weekend. Uh, yeah. Or would you guys rather go to Tucson and hike? You know what I mean? Exactly. Get Put put the power in their hand. Either exactly. way, they're going to win because you're going to get outside. So being outside is really cool. And it's also like my breathing technique. It's, it's usually super free uh, yes. and you don't have to worry about that, but there's an outdoor thing about what goes on in your brain Correct. when yes. you're outside with the elements, right? Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? So maybe people can land on that connection. Yeah, I think, you know, sometimes being outside makes you feel like you have some sense of freedom. You're not isolated within the same environment for a, a certain period of time. I know when you get isolated after two days, you feel like you become too, become anxious. You become that you need to be out. And this is the same thing. Like if you notice, even small animals, if you don't take your pet out, like your animals start to react within the households and they're not being comfortable. They need to breathe a little bit. I've seen that from my own self when I see them um, being happy in the moment, but then at some point they need to be out to take a yeah. walk or they need to be out to the, use the restroom. So I think, you know, our kids sometimes, they are in school all day. They come home, they have the same routine. Mom tells you to do your homework. Mom tells you the same thing. You got to finish your dinner. Mom tells you the same thing. Go ahead, take a shower and get and go to sleep. So it becomes a routine every day. So when you allow the routine to take a toll on your life every day, then you don't allow creativity. You don't allow a room for improvement to make sure that everybody is healthy. And healthy can be also healthy in the mind. And that's what we want to focus on is making sure that people at the dinner table can be able to talk and have an open discussion about everything. I think it's healthy to do that. I do too. And there, mm -hmm. there's so many opportunities with, if you pay attention to the news or you pay attention mm -hmm. to pop culture. I mean, there's a right. million ways to get in and join the conversation. If you were, uh, okay, let's switch gears and let's, let's say parents now parents are watching mm -hmm. us. They've got, they've got a child that they've identified has some needs and they're mm -hmm. looking for answers right now too. What's a, what's a really great way for a mom and a dad to ask a tough question? It's to be able to listen without judgment. Okay. Always let them speak to you. Have your child come to you. Be open to them. You know, your child will feel if you don't want to talk to them. Your child will feel if mommy is going to be upset with me if I say this. So once you allow your kids to feel safe, that it's okay to come to, to mommy about this topic. Because I know sometimes culture plays a big role. Some females, they like to talk to mom about a certain topic. I like to talk to dad about certain things. And sometimes parents, they define their roles in the family. You go to your mom for certain mm. things and you go to your dad for certain things. Sure, and sure. I think when the kids look at the role sometimes can be a difficult thing if the kids may not be comfortable with another parent. So I think both parents need to join together 
in an effort to make sure that their kids are being heard. Um, I think it's an open conversation without any judgment. My daughter can come to me about any topic. If she's going through something um, with a girlfriend of hers and dad is willing to pinch in, I think it's okay. Uh, it shouldn't be only mom that can give you her perspective. I think the child can also give their perspective. You are correct, right? And when you mm -hmm. lead with love, there's all these different things that start to happen mm -hmm. with regards because I truly believe in, in like we're not so different from animals right we can right. feel things we That's can right. feel mm -hmm. like when like you just said when i might get in trouble or when i need to walk mm -hmm. on an eggshell we can feel those things right. as human beings and kids i think they're they're hypersensitive to them right. i think they might be right. more sensitive to them than we are right and um go ahead one yeah i was just gonna ask also it's also important to set consistent expectations you know like the kids need to know that of course this is mom and dad and they also have to learn how to respect their parents making sure that there is that boundary and there's also expectations once they know that this is a role of a parent and this is a role of their teacher i think that's why they know who to, they can respect in society so they have a structure i think structure can also help a child go navigate through life and navigate through life with with the sense of knowing what to expect in life and and parents also can play a good role in that, you know, and making sure that their kids um, can overcome any any challenges either in school or either at home with those expectations. Yeah. Okay. So this is a good segue because now we get into this space that I love more than anything <laughs> right now, which is, okay, what's your job to take care of? What is your responsibility? We all have a story. Now mm -hmm. it's time to own it. And then we get to lean into shifting it or changing it. Right. But that all is going to start with figuring that part out. So like, let's, ju let's jump into that segue into that, into that, that next part of tools. And um, what is your job as you see it from the role of a mom or a dad with regard to just boundaries, because uh, it's not the child's job to put those boundaries up. It's mm -hmm. your job to figure out what they are and then enforce them, right? So right. with regard to boundaries, what's the first thing that we can chat with moms and dads about in, in terms of putting them up and enforcing them? Well, example of boundaries, I would say, you know, lately we've seen a lot of kids just using a lot of electronics. And I think it's a very easy access. You know, and sometimes they see access to electronics, you tend to forget a little bit about what's going on in the real world. And you tend to focus on this imaginary world of world of uh, video games or worlds of um, everything is different. So when you take a tablet off or a phone off, then the child feels disoriented and they get upset. And I've been working with parents. So and every time they say, what was the trigger of the argument? Oh, because I took their phone away or they, I took their electronics away. And that got me thinking is that, well, if you introduce something that you know it's going to be an issue later on, then you would have to use everything in moderation. If I give you a tablet, that means you have to work hard to get to that tablet. So I have to reward you to, uh, to give you that tablet or to give you your phone back. So if we provide easy access to a lot of things that may be hurtful to our children, then there may be like consequence later on. So we have to be very cautious about what we allow and don't allow. Yeah, my uh, I had a surgeon who did back surgery and one time and he said the br most brilliant thing. He said, don't make choices today that remove choices tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I just yeah. I, I think that's such a great mantra for for so many parents. Right. right. Who right. want a quick fix and right. want it to be over fast. But boy, it's a marathon and yeah. it's going to it's going to be a long, <laughs> long race. Right. Yeah. Uh, when I was on my retreat, one of the things that I came to learn was that it was my job to fix very basic fundamental things like hunger. It was mm. my job to fix things like thirst. Uh, it was my job to fix things like sleep. It was my job to fix things like exercise and movement. And for so many of our little people right now, our teenagers, right? You just nailed it. They, they, they are moving less. They may not be right. getting the greatest sleep. They might not be eating the best foods, right? Okay. And I know we all want to pretend like it's really complicated, but it's really so simple. It's silly. Yeah. If, if you pay attention to what you put into your body and Correct. you pay attention to when you're thirsty and you pay mm -hmm. attention to when you're tired and you move when you feel the need to, yeah. there's a shift that starts to take place there right away. Can, can you maybe let's brainstorm for a little bit. Okay. So this mm -hmm. isn't planned. Nobody had any, anything planned here, but 
What are some other areas that you think are a teenager's responsibility in terms of taking care of themselves? Not mom's dad or, or dad's jobs, not their brothers and sisters, not their teachers. It's their responsibility. Well, I've noticed also things that I'm experimenting with kids is the personal hygiene. Mm, you know, personal, it's a great you, know, place to start. you know, it's a place to start as, as, as a young adult to take care of themselves, to give them the, that independence. Um, you want to teach your child to be independent at a very, very um, young age. And I know uh, myself, you know, my dad was wanted to make sure that I was independent as early as he wanted. Like I think 14 was maybe from what I remember was an age where, you know, you have to be independent. You have to know exactly how you take care of yourself because I may not be here with you at some point. So, um, and taking care of yourself is not only hygiene, is also taking care of yourself mentally, is also taking care of yourself physically, is also taking care of your school, of your own person as a whole. Um, I think that's also one thing that I would like to um, parents to know is allow your child to take care of themselves. When you spoil your children too much it's okay at first but then sometimes it may be a disservice in the end and it might actually bite you because your children will grow and they will be a little bit different with you and they're like well you allowed me to do this you allowed me to do that and now you say no to me mm -hmm. uh, and i've seen that too that also creates that conflict with families it's confusing right it's confusing Correct. because mm -hmm. it's, in, it's inconsistent well you right. and you nailed something there uh you said it's important that we take care of ourselves mentally and physically and so again i love the translator mm -hmm. dive, dive a little deeper right so that means that when something hurts you yes. tell mom and dad about it and exactly. conversely, right? That That's exactly mm -hmm. what that means. And right. you just are okay with the fact that there might be a consequence of it. You know, right. that you may have to take time away from school or from a yeah. job or whatever. Yes. Those things are going to happen. Yeah. And then mentally it's the same thing. Yeah. And, you know, you're, this is a little bit more your space than mine, but I've kind of come to learn that if you're sort of feeling the same way for a couple of weeks straight, mm -hmm. that's a pretty good indication that it's time to put something on the table to to start to figure it out. Do, do you yeah. like that? Yes, I think, you know, if we look at our kids, pay attention to what they tell you. I always say pay attention to the nonverbals. You don't mm -hmm. want to wait until your kid is talking to you. And sometimes if the behavior has changed after a week, after two weeks, then it's okay to check in. Is everything okay? How's school today? Was school fun today? Um, we want to ask our kids this question. Did you have fun? Do you not have fun? And it's okay, even if they didn't have a good day, you know, we don't want to be mad or upset or showing them that you had a bad day at school. It, you know, you may have a bad day at work too. So you want to relate them to have those conversation openly without any judgment. And I think I always want to make sure, because when I hear feedback from children, oh, mom doesn't understand me. Or she's always thinking that I'm not a good kid. Or she's always making sure that um, I don't listen to her or I don't look good enough. Or I'm more, always wearing bad clothes. Or So then the, the feedback that I'm getting from the child and I'm noticing it's always similar feedbacks. And if we're just making sure that mom is listening to the child without having the child tell us what's going on, I think we can reduce some of the issues that those children are experiencing. Yeah, there's a great, mm -hmm. there's a, you know, I'm a big, uh, the Frank Lutz is a dude who used to write some speeches <laughs> and he say, there's a big difference between what you say and what people hear. Right. And our kids, boy, <laughs> that's never more true than it is with our children, isn't it? I mean, there's a big difference between what you say and what they hear or right. feel. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, and, and most of that stuff, and, and this is another one of my favorite subjects in the whole world these days, most of that stuff is your own, that's your yeah. own garbage and baggage and stuff mm -hmm. that you've just never really gone to work on and figure yeah. out where it's coming from. And then mm -hmm. you end up projecting that on your kids. Right. Mm -hmm. And that is correct. I, I would love to go down that rabbit hole right now, which is to say that there, there are some instances where there, the, the, the kid's problem is mom and dad. That's right. They are the problem. It's sad to say, but it is, it but is, it's, it's you have to, to have the messy conversation right. about it. Don't right. you? Right. It's true. It, it is sad to say, because if you raise your child at home with honesty and building that trust, society may have, you know, its own role as well on shaping your child, but it starts at home. It starts at home. If the home is solid, is the home is is safe the child is solid the child is safe and even if mom is not feeling okay or dad is not feeling okay it's okay to ask for help and be honest about it yeah i have a yeah. friend of mine who's a psychologist and he's he's like he handles kids and mm -hmm. he'll tell me he's like 
to in every 10. I have to call yeah. mom and dad after and I have to say, you got to back off. You got to slow yeah. down. Okay. It's it's like what I'm getting from this person mm -hmm. is it's too much right now. And um, uh, Troy DeSmet, who's on the Learn From People Who Lived It podcast, has a thing mm -hmm. where he says, you know, you got to learn to parent with your kids, not on your parent, okay. uh, not on your kids. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I love talking about this because to me, this is one of <laughs> yeah. those fundamental pieces that I don't think enough people unlock, which is to say mom and dad might have their own traumas. Right. It's quite possible. Mm -hmm. we, we just mentioned that the kids had some. So they're most of them are going to become parents one day. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, you know, so what we have, what we hold on to is mom and dad gets put onto our own kids, whether you like right. it or not. They get all mm -hmm. the good. They get all the bad. Right. So um, let's have that conversation a little bit about the moment where maybe a mom and a dad has that awakening and they go, OK, holy smokes. Yeah. Maybe I am my mom. Maybe mm -hmm. I am my dad. Maybe I am being a little bit too hard. Right. Um, this can put you into a space that's uncomfortable and you know what happens in uncomfortable spaces. Nobody goes right. there. Right. So they stay away. Right. But that to me is like, that's where you need to lean in even right. more. Right. So um, let's hash that out a little bit. Right. Mom and dad just had a realization. I am the problem. Um, what would you advise them to do next? I would just advise them to give the child their own time to heal. You know, sometimes children need space too. You know, sometimes you want to um, not suffocate your child. I think sometimes, we, you know, parents, we want to always check in. Are you okay? Are you okay? Is everything fine? And teenagers these days, you know, they'll be like, yes, I'm fine. And, you know, they slam doors and they don't want to talk to their parents anymore. So I think if you give your child some space, your child will always come to you. Always, if no matter what happens, at some point the child have its own time to reflect, they will come back to their parents. And I think also parents need to also teach themselves what's wrong with them. They need to also dig a little bit deeper with their own selves and then understand where they where they were at fault. And if therapy is helping, maybe they can go and check therapy without letting their kids know. Maybe they can work on themselves, make sure they are the best version of themselves, and then come back to the family unit and make sure that everybody is um, stable and together. I yeah. think um, the most important thing I always say, it's okay to say that I'm not okay. That's it. I mean, I can't, my kids have heard more than a dozen times in our <laughs> life. Guys, I'm, so, I'm sorry. That was, that was my thing. That was mm -hmm. something that was mine. And boy, did I put all of it on you. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, and, and again, I like to go back to guys cause we're pretty, pretty famous for doing this, but we have a bad day or we have a, a bad meeting or we have a bad experience. And because we internalize, we come home and we just tend to project and we tend to be aggressive. And this mm -hmm. is like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not telling anybody anything you don't know. We've known this, you know, when you're a kid on the playground, we know boys are more aggressive. Mm -hmm. Um, but but as men, we, we tend to fall down that rabbit hole again and we tend to internalize and then we tend to get a little angry and, and mm -hmm. do that whole thing. Yeah. And I always love passing along this little anecdote, which I learned in my own therapy sessions, which was mm -hmm. to say that I learned my anxiety shows itself through anger. So mm -hmm. when I'm anxious, that shows yeah. itself through anger. And I think that's something yeah. that can resonate with a lot of parents right. as, 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 a, as a light bulb moment, right? To say, oh, holy smokes, maybe I'm the same way. Yeah. Every time I'm anxious, I'm a little bit irritable. Right, mm. right. Yeah. And then key in on that whole thing, because it really is just about, you know, giving our kids an, a, a better version of them, you know, than what we got, right? Aren't we all trying to do that? Right. And, you know, you brought up a point also that I've been thinking is that sometimes parents, you know, the way how they are with their girls is different than how they are with their boys. You know, when you're saying, you know, this is what I say to my son, that this is me. So it's different when a mommy says that to her daughter, um, you know, being a daughter myself. And I know how my mom was me, with me was completely different on how she was with my brother, mm -hmm. although she would disagree with that statement. But I certainly believe that moms are different for um, their, for their girls um, versus their boys. And yeah. That also can be a really um, problem. And then a lot of kids, you know, mental, because why are you treating my brother better? Why are you treating, you know, the daughter more strict than the actual brother? I cannot go to see my friends, but my brother can see friends. Right. Can I date? No, he can date, but I cannot date at this age. So a lot of issues that we can open that onion and then 
look at the layers. Are we really treating our kids fairly or are we playing a different in gender here? Yeah, boy, that is such a good thing to bring up because people mm -hmm. need to know about it. And, yeah. and, and, and just for the sole reason that as a lot of kids are going through their own awakenings and coming mm -hmm. into who they are, yeah. uh, as we know full well, the worst thing in the world is for them to grow up feeling like mom and dad are going to resent or judge right. or have some kind of, uh, well, judgment on them. Right. That's a, right. that's a tough feeling for a kid. And so if they feel like they can be anything and do anything, right. boy, then they just might. And how cool would that be? You know, that's the way exactly. I look at it. Um, all right. Now let's drill down on um, helping people out. So uh, I'm a fr I'm a friend. I'm a mom. I'm a dad. I'm an uncle. I'm a sister, whatever the case is. And I have somebody that I love who's really going through it right now. Um, I mean, outside of going to the doctor and mm -hmm. getting a proper diagnosis, which is the, you know, the, the number one thing that anybody should do is go talk to your doctor first. Like I said, if it's been more than a couple of weeks, but yeah. how can I support people in that space? I think one of the things that I'm noticing now is that we need to make sure that like we go through the baby steps to seek treatment. I think sometimes parents, when they go to the emergency room or they go to certain doctors, certain doctors may prescribe or diagnose a child with some of the challenges that the child is facing of the moment. But sometimes, in my opinion, I think they prescribe them for issues that may be long-term issues. They may think that they have depression for a long period of time. And I think that I believe in the baby step model, meaning that like, let's start with a small therapy. Therapy. Let's start with a group therapy. Mm -hmm. And then let's start with the psychologist. Then we can see the psychiatrist, right? Right, for sure. Because for sure. the psychiatrist to me is the ultimate solution that because we have exhausted all the other solutions and then we get to the psychiatrist as the last resort for help. Because I always believe that children have their best potential at a young age. Because once you know how to save a child at a young age, they can true their best potential as an adult. Because at that moment, they get their awakening while they're 14, 15. And we hope by the time they're 19 and in college, they have got that awakening that they need. Um, if we, that makes um, sense. Yeah, for sure. In in yeah. um, episode one of the podcast, Learn from People Who Lived It, uh, Carrie lost her son tragically to a, an accidental overdose. And one of the things that she said in the podcast was, I wish I would have just gone in and sat with him more. I wish mm -hmm. I would have just yeah. gone in and sat there until yeah. he said something. That's right. Um, and and that was a big one for me when I was going through my own mental health battles. The I, I would tell my wife all the time, the biggest way you can support me is that when you feel like I'm quiet and I'm shut down, ask mm -hmm. me what's going on. That's right. Ask me to articulate right. what right. I'm thinking and feeling. Right. And and just by that happening, mm -hmm. like you said, now I have permission. Now yeah. I feel like I can be open. Yeah. Um, and when you because you got to read that body language, like I talked about, that's right. such a huge I, thing. So right. that's my number one tip for parents Except, is like, me too. Yeah. yeah, go and just ask, hey, what's what's up? You know, and yeah. don't give me that crap about how was your day? What's on your what? mind? Mm -hmm. you yeah, exactly. Look your kids yeah. in the eye like your like your blood and ask yeah. them a question, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right, let's let's keep going. There's other ways that we can support these people. Um you know, checking in via text message every day with something nice, but yeah, uh, let's, exactly. let's, what else can, what else can we do? I think being a supportive parent means that you also um celebrate your kids' success mm. and be okay with their failures. And what I mean by that is they have a tournament going or they have a, a football game coming. Go and cheer for your kids. It's, you know, be there for them. Be their own cheerleader. I think when you go there and you physically show them that you are celebrating their success, you are my hero. They can feel that. They can feel like you have accomplished something. And I think it's it's okay to celebrate those successes with our yeah. children and seeing them being happy. And on the other hand, it's okay also to look at our failures and be okay with if, if it was a failure moment and learn from it. Be able to acknowledge, okay, this was a bad experience. Things happen. I'm here to help you show you that things can get better. And be open to have that open conversation. And we need to learn how to speak to our kids without being angry, without showing them that we're angry. If we speak with them with a simple language, 
they will gravitate toward us. They're your blood, like what you said, right? Yeah. It's your blood. So your blood will come to you. You will attract that positive energy. Um, another thing also that we talked about earlier, I think, is to acknowledge achievements and also support mistakes. Mm-hmm. Mistakes are okay to be made. And it's if a big we, deal. It's it, one of the biggest shifts yeah. I think we have to make in our society is becoming mm-hmm. a better with being okay with failure and mistakes and such. Yeah. And of course, treating them fairly. You always want to make sure that kids are being felt as being treated fairly. Um, of course, trauma can never be avoided in their life. But if we try to help them from that moment and slowly give them the skills and be there for them and help them and listen to them, I think you know, one day at a time, you will see that your kid is feeling much better. I have hope myself for that. Yeah. And, 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 and then, like we said, I mean, just always remember to keep it basic. There's, there's right. so many, yeah, that's the you key. try to yes. look for the magic pill and the magic answer, right. but a lot of times just going and sitting is, is about the best thing you can do. Going for a walk, like you said, is the best thing right. you can do. Uh, I had a situation with my 15 year old a few weeks ago and it was clear to me that he just needed a couple of days alone with his dad, you know? And so we yeah. got in the truck and we took off and we that's went in the nice. woods for a couple of days and it was like, Oh, that's you know, nice. You got to yeah. do that. You got to right, take that right, time and, right. and do those things. But um, I think this has been a very, really a uh, helpful conversation for parents. Um, if there's anything that I'm leaving out, I hope that you'll, 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 you'll scream it out from the mountaintops right now. But if we can implore anything, it's just that we, we hope that kids I want to give kids the confidence to talk. If if you're thinking that you're the Mm -hmm. only one, number one, you're not. There's so many people, like I said, one in three feel this way right now. So it's so much more common than you think. I just hope that you'll have the wind in your sails to communicate to somebody who can give you a hand. And one thing that I also want to mention is that also co-parenting. You know, if you come from a household of a divorced parent and sometimes kids feel uncomfortable talking to the new parent, the new parent, please also listen to that child because that child are just there. So you also want to make sure that you listen to that child because oftentimes um, grownups takes a little bit, they take things a little bit more personal on stepchildren. And I think that's also another topic, but I also wanted to listeners to be a good co-parent be That's very polite advice. you know to to um to the child's mom or to the child father be that family unit treat those children with love and give them the respect and give them so much love so they can be good as well so good. Right? Anybody who comes across <laughs> your path is lucky. That's for sure. Well, thank you. Thank well, I really appreciate your time, Miriam. Thank you of for course. doing this with me. And uh, I really I'll... appreciate it. Yes, we hope to reach as many hearts as we can. And we want to let everybody know that there's always light at the end of the tunnel. That's how yeah. I live. my. There's always that light at the end. So if we know that there is light at the end, everything will be just okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think Miriam's the light. Thank you so much for being with us today. When I go into schools to talk to kids about their own mental wellness, I say to them this, let's talk about your day. Did you ever have something happen to you that bothered you? You just couldn't stop thinking about it. Of course you did. It's totally normal. Everybody, including your teachers and parents have bad days. But the key is to make sure that your bad day doesn't become somebody else's bad day. See, we all have these things that happen to us along the way, and they're going to have an impact on us. But the tricky part is that we don't realize that it started to have that impact on our life. So what does that mean? Let's see it in action. You have a bad day at school, maybe a bad test grade, and you know full well when you get home, your mom and dad are going to ask you about it. Uh Uh-oh. Fear thought number one. So before you even get home, you've already decided how they're going to react. So in that moment of fear, you, you what? Maybe you yell at your mom or you talk back to your dad or you tease your little brothers or sisters. Why? You're making a bad decision because you're scared. The stuff that's inside of you. Let's try this again. Somebody or someone put something online that's not true. In fact, it was really mean-spirited. The problem is that you saw it on your way to school and now you feel like what? Of course you feel bad. But what's important is how we carry ourselves after those moments. Show of hands. Who thinks that uh, a kid should be upset, angry, and lash out at everybody that tries to help him? Exactly. You guys already know this stuff. 
Now, there's more to that presentation and a lot of fun stuff included. Uh, and if you'd like to reach out about having me in the school, please send an email to info at learnfrompeoplewholivedit.com. And don't forget, I'd love a follow on Instagram or Facebook at Matthew Blades Media so we can help spread this good word. Thank you for listening to Learn From People Who Lived It. A reminder, again, that ASI, or Advanced Systems Integration, designs and installs cutting-edge audio and visual equipment. This woman-owned small business is big enough to find an AV solution for your next boardroom, classroom, council chambers, or courtroom. Bring in ASI and two decades of AV experience. Visit ASI-AV.com to see their gallery of work.